Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Violent crime up just about everywhere in the country, including right here in Detroit, and a recent shooting of teenagers has the interim chief very concerned. All right, Sean, parts of Metro Detroit hit by afternoon storms, and it's left thousands without power now. But first, a local woman is using a tragedy as a call to action, how she's making sure her late husband is not forgotten. Good evening, everybody, and that tops our news here at 6. Plymouth Canton schools are set to start in-person learning this fall. They are recommending students wear a mask in the building, but they're not requiring it. As Kim DiGiulio reports, one woman who lost her husband to COVID-19 says a recommendation is simply not enough. The Plymouth Canton Community School District is gearing up to start in-person classes this fall. They're recommending that students and staff wear a mask in the building. However, one woman who lost her husband to COVID-19 last year says a recommendation is not enough. A recommendation means nothing during a pandemic. It's going to take everybody to join together and do this. Lauren Lucas is the widow of Don Lucas, a former security guard and substitute teacher in the Plymouth Canton Community School District. Probably one of the greatest human beings I've ever met, to be completely honest. In November, we brought you his heartbreaking story on how he contracted COVID-19 and died just 22 days later. I had to make the decision to take life support off of him over the phone. It's a big loss. I'll never wake up from the nightmare. And now as the school year approaches, Lauren is concerned the district's mask recommendation will put the students and staff in danger. The kids are being put at risk. These, most of the kids aren't vaccinated. They're wide open for this virus. The district states, consistent with MDHHS and CDC recommendations, we are strongly recommending, but not requiring, the wearing of face masks while indoors for students, staff, and regular volunteers. However, Michigan's chief medical executive, Dr. Janae Caldoun, says those guidelines are not consistent with CDC recommendations. The actual recommendation is that schools have universal masking. Lauren says now all she can do is carry on Don's legacy. I'm my husband's voice. I'm just going to use my voice. I I can't think of any other way to do it. There's a school board meeting for the district tomorrow evening. Lauren plans to be there. In Canton, I'm Kim DeGiulio, Local 4. Thank you, Kim. And we did just receive a new state coronavirus update this afternoon. Here are the latest numbers. 2,720 new cases were reported. That is a three-day average, about 906 cases per day. Eight more people died. 63.9% of Michigan residents 16 and older have gotten at least one dose of the coronavirus vaccine. Also making headlines, school-age athletes have the green light to start practicing for fall sports today. The vast majority of them are doing it without masks. And speaking of masks, University of Michigan announced that face coverings are required indoors starting August 11th. This is regardless of vaccination status. Meantime, Meyer is offering college students a $10 coupon if they get their COVID-19 vaccination at a Meyer store. We're also learning the Pentagon will require members of the U.S. military to get a COVID-19 vaccination by September 15th. U of M, Michigan State, and Wayne State require all students, staff, and faculty to get vaccinated for COVID-19. So far, Oakland University only has a vaccine requirement for some students, and this has some faculty concern. Students living in a residential housing area must be fully vaccinated against COVID, but vaccinations are not required for others. Faculty wants this to change. What we want is a mandate for vaccination of the entire Oakland University community. My deepest fears are our faculty will resign. That the, we have a number of faculty who have already approached me and said, I cannot work under these conditions. I'm going to have to leave and I'm not gonna be able to give very much notice. The president of the university strongly encourages vaccinations. Students also must wear masks on campus regardless of vaccination status. All right, let's turn our attention to the weather, and we have some storms hitting parts of Macomb County pretty hard right now. These are pictures coming from Mount Clemens, where thousands of DTE customers are now without power. With a total of 41,000, 
without electricity all across Metro Detroit. Andrew Humphrey in tonight with what we can expect for the rest of the evening. Andrew. And Karen and Jason, as you highlighted, those storms moved through earlier this afternoon, posting thunderstorm warnings for parts of Macomb County and into St. Clair County. Those warnings are now gone. That's some good news, but we're not out of the woods just yet. Some more showers and a couple of thunderstorms have pa uh, popped up in recent uh, 30 minutes or so. I say a few thunderstorms because you have only, only one or in this case now zero lightning strikes here within the past 15 minutes, but these heavier cells are moving through parts of Washtenaw County, parts of Wayne County on top of Romulus right now, but headed toward places like Superior Township, Ypsilanti, also Northville between now and about 630. These are not severe, but they still bear watching. They're moving into some more stable air, so that's some good news. It looks like we'll still see at least some heavy downpours across western Wayne County into Washtenaw County within the next 30 minutes. And here's a highlight of some more damage in parts of Macomb County before this afternoon was over. From those storms, multiple Report, multiple reports of trees down and power lines down. Also, trees down at least, also towards South Lyon. Any more thunderstorms during the overnight hours? We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the possibility of more thunderstorms and more high heat and humidity for this week in your seven day forecast. Three teenagers hospitalized after a shootout at a youth football game on Detroit's west side over the weekend. Defender Sean Lay joins us this evening with new information into what happened. Sean. Karen, good evening to you. The chief certainly concerned about the young ages involved in the shooting you're talking about and the uptick of shootings he says he's seeing across the city. We are seeing uh, a pattern of violent behavior. Uh, it has been a very violent weekend in our city. Interim Detroit Police Chief James White calling out what he is calling a disturbing uptick in violent crime, highlighted by the shooting of a 14-year-old and two 15-year-olds at a football game at McCabe Field, where there were hundreds of people there to watch their kids play this weekend. A group of teens outside the field, two cars pull up, filled with teens and adults. Some type of confrontation ensues, uh, and there's gunfire on both parts. That's right. And it was an argument on social media that sparked the whole thing. Very young teens outside of the field and young teens and adults in the cars who opened fire. It's remarkable no one was killed. Those targeted or innocent bystanders, long guns were used and these handguns. You've got hundreds of people on the other side of the fence. Thank goodness that they didn't decide to resolve that dispute inside of that facility. We honestly need uh, better decision making. We need the support of the community. Uh, we need personal responsibility. Uh, we need parental oversight. Back here live, five people currently being held for the shooting of those three. The three are expected to be okay. Let's dig a little deeper, guys, and talk about the weekend and the shootings from Friday at six o'clock in the evening until midnight Sunday. 18 non fatal shootings and three fatal shootings. We're live in Detroit tonight. Oh. Sean Lay, Local 4, back to you. Very disturbing. All right, thank you, Sean. Today, Canada reopened its border to the U.S. for people who are fully vaccinated. For more than a year, Canada stopped Americans from making non-essential visits. Priya Mann tonight with a closer look at the changes and how they're impacting people here in Metro Detroit. If you have loved ones in Canada or just wanted to visit our neighbors to the north, which is technically south of us when you're in Detroit, the wait is over, but it comes with strings attached. I'm very excited. This is the moment Zena Yufafi has been thinking about for nearly a year and a half. I have a niece and nephew there. I haven't been able to see them, so I'm really emotional. <laughs> like so many Americans with loved ones in Canada, the border closure has been especially difficult given the proximity to our neighbors on the other side of the Detroit River. Very frustrating because we're only 10 minutes, so I feel like this should have happened a long time ago. U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents will have to show more than their passport to enter Canada. They must prove they're fully vaxxed, show documentation of a negative test result within three days before crossing, and register on the ArriveCan app. Lacking proper documentation at the Canadian border will have you in the same boat as Shai Khan. What was it like over there? Um, well, it was super quick, so I couldn't tell you. He had a negative COVID test Thursday, which did not fall within the three day span required by the Canadian government. Um, pulled up, he just gave me a little slip. He was like, here's what's wrong with your documents and pretty much go back. He plans to visit loved ones in Windsor once he gets another COVID test. Meanwhile, Americans and legal permanent residents returning to the U.S. from Canada are not required to show proof they're vaccinated or have a negative test.
you know what I mean? They're taking precautions, which is very understandable. And I think like I'm all for it, you know. And if you're an American or legal permanent resident returning to the U.S., you are not required to show proof that you're vaccinated or a negative COVID test. At the Ambassador Bridge, I'm Priya Mam, Local 4. All right, Priya. The closure for Canadians entering the U.S. for non-essential travel remains in place until August 21st. University of Michigan lecturers quit their contract with the university. Members of the lecturers union gathered in. And we've been bargaining for eight months to try to get uh, pay parity across the three campuses and to lift the Dearborn and Flint lecturers out of uh, basically poverty wages um, into a, a more respectable salary. The lecturers aren't on strike but could vote to strike in 30 days. We're back on the 6th with the doc here to answer your COVID questions. Including whether the vaccine is safe in people with asthma. That's coming up. But first, a drunk driver is responsible for causing a crash right in front of a state trooper in Oakland County. That's coming up next.